Well, good afternoon. Uh, it's great, uh, it's great, great to be back in Gainesville and uh, be able to have the opportunity to spend some time with you. And so, uh, since I am the first one of the year, hopefully I won't set too low a bar for the, that everybody else will easily, uh, easily jump over as, uh, as they come and present to you throughout the year. But it really is fun to have the opportunity to come back. I have done this a couple times before, but it's been a really long time. It was back in the uh, late 90s, uh, the first time, and then maybe like 2001 or 2002, the second time. So it's been quite a while, and I'm thrilled to be here and, uh, you know, really impressed with everything that I know about uh, the students in the program and, you know, what's happened in here uh, in the program. So uh, this is going to be a lot more interesting if you all ask questions and don't feel like you need to wait till the end to ask questions. Please don't hesitate to, uh, to interrupt and, uh, and ask questions along the way when there's something on your mind. Uh, because I really, I really do want to talk about what it is that you're interested in hearing about and not necessarily what I think you might be interested in hearing about. So uh, help me out with that if you don't mind. Uh, so my plan will be to walk you through my career path. Um, I'll also talk a little bit about, you know, what's real estate development in an operating company like Darden or, uh, you know, operating restaurant or hospitality company. So, kind of what's that really look like in practice? And then I thought you might be interested in hearing a little bit about um, uh, uh, something that I worked on at Darden um, uh, the last couple years that I was there where we went through a process of monetizing Darden's real estate and um, uh, thought that you might find that of interest. So when I get to that part, I've actually got slides that I'm going to share with you that are literally from the Darden website, from their analyst presentations, you know, back at the time when some of this was happening. And so I'll walk you through that with a little bit of context. I am going to go through my career path in a good bit of detail, um, uh, mainly just to give you a sense for um, you know, what the types of jobs are that exist in a, you know, in corporate real estate for uh, an operating company. And also, I think to give you a sense of sort of where my career took me and often in unexpected places. And so my theme with that is I, to encourage each of you to remain open-minded as you think about your careers because there's nothing that I did throughout my career that I ever would have imagined doing when I was sitting in your chair. You know, so, um, so I just encourage you to, to stay open-minded. So um, as Dr. Ling mentioned, I got both my uh, undergraduate and MBA here. I went straight through, which you know, obviously wouldn't happen today, but that was still something that could happen back in the day. Um, and the reason that I did it was I had played on the, on the golf team and I had the opportunity to stay and work as the assistant women's golf coach while I was getting my MBA, and it was just another opportunity for me to get, uh, get my education paid for and seemed like kind of too good a deal uh, to pass up at the time. And so, you know, I got out of the MBA program with zero uh, work experience. Um, I did do one internship as a financial analyst in between my two years of the MBA program. Um, but uh, I actually, one of the classes that I was taking as part of my concentration in real estate in the MBA program, I shared a little bit earlier, was actually Dr. Archer's appraisal course. And um, it was in Matherly Hall and posted on the wall in the, it was a, in the fall, posted on the wall in that class was a notice that Taco Bell was going to come on campus and interview for what they called area real estate managers. And I saw that and I hadn't even thought about the fact that somebody had to find real estate for something like Taco Bell prior to seeing that and um, ended up uh, you know, going on that interview thinking it was the coolest job that I'd ever heard about and then that ended up being you know, what, my, what my career ended up, ended up being all about. So um, I'd also tell you, and I mentioned this to Dr. Ling earlier, um, of the real estate courses that I took and you know, the concentration in real estate in the MBA, it was really just three classes. Um, and I honestly don't even remember what the other two real estate courses were, but the appraisal course. And the reality is, is that that's probably the class that I had that I've used the most throughout my entire career. And it's because it, you know, sort of put, uh, you know, an analytical context uh, and construct 
around you know, how to think about you know, how you value a piece of real estate. And while I've never actually appraised a piece of property, there's been many times in my career where I've had to make a business case for why we should play, pay X for a particular site. And you know, we're always looking at what we could afford to pay for the site, but we also had to think of it in the context of what's that site really worth. And being able to articulate that and think about it in the right way you know, has really uh, served me well throughout my entire career. So anyway, I, I uh, started with Taco Bell uh, in 1986. Um, uh, went into um, a very informal uh, training program and uh, worked as an area real estate manager after a few months of kind of just tagging along with um, existing uh, real estate managers and kind of learning from them. Um, I had the opportunity to uh, work uh, South Florida market, so Dade and Broward counties in Florida, and then um, ended up moving to Atlanta and worked in, uh, in Georgia. And over three years in that role, had the opportunity to do 40 deals. So if you think about you know, getting experience doing transactions, uh, while they were smaller transactions, smaller deals, there was real experience there negotiating purchase agreements, negotiating ground leases, you know, identifying, you know, it was, it was, and it wasn't just about making the deal, it was also about what's the right strategy um, uh, for development in those, um, in the markets that I was working and executing against that strategy in a way that would allow us to maximize our, our uh, build out potential. And uh, myself and then two of my classmates who got hired at the same time, uh, at Taco Bell, we were a little bit of guinea pigs for Taco Bell then in terms of hiring people that didn't have any uh, corporate real estate experience. Most people doing that type of work back then had worked in, uh, for other fast food companies or uh, the gas stations, you know, Mobile or Exxon, et cetera. And um, they you know, decided to try bringing people in that didn't have any preconceived notions or ideas, training them how to find a great site for Taco Bell, how to create the strategy and make the deals and um, you know, ended up turning out great. And then as we accelerated growth over the next many years, uh, we, um, Taco Bell went through a process of hiring anywhere from 20 to 30 folks like us every year for three years in a row as we were really building up the, building up the team. So, so I got that experience uh, in the field doing deals. And then uh, I moved to uh, Irvine, California for a year, which was where Taco Bell's corporate headquarters were. And um, this is the first example of saying, keep an open mind, because uh, I said no to this opportunity. It was clear it was just gonna be a year that was the position um, was this manager of site analysis position. And essentially, it was taking all of the new deals that were getting done in the field and presenting those sites to the um, senior leadership team for approval. So we had a formal uh, approval package you know, that included aerial photographs and maps and all the demographics, all the financial analysis, all of the competitive analysis, et cetera. And so my job was to review that information, make sure that everything was there that needed to be there, have a point of view on it, and be able to present it in you know, like five minutes to the senior team and get the, get the site approved. And you know, the reason that I didn't want to do the job at first wasn't because I didn't want to do the job, but I didn't want to move to Southern California. I was living in Atlanta at the time, thought that I wanted to stay there for the rest of my life. And uh, fortunately, I had uh, a mentor that kind of kicked me and said, you know, this is really something you should do. Uh, you're the one that's being asked to go do this. And so I went and did it for a year, and the next thing I knew, I was director of real estate in uh, living in Philadelphia, uh, running the uh, uh, real estate for the northeastern U.S. and eastern Canada, and had you know eight to twelve people you know reporting to me on my team uh, during that time frame, and got the experience then of leading a team for the first time, and also working in a very difficult geographic market, you know, and it's kind of like if you can if you can do deals in the Northeast or in California, you know, you kind of have credibility as a, as a deal maker. And so that experience really served me well uh, throughout my career, having had that experience. And the reality is if you ever want to run a national program, you need to have that 
uh, that experience um, uh, anyway. So uh, had the opportunity there to you know, do up to my last year. Uh, we did 92 deals in my uh, part of the world there my, my last year. Ultimately then, uh, I said I wanted to live in Atlanta my whole life, and so I decided I wanted to get back to Atlanta. So, um, and also felt like uh, while Taco Bell had been a great experience for me, didn't really, I didn't know what I didn't know yet about uh, what type of company I wanted to work in uh, and, you know, kind of more fully, you know, uh, uh, you know, corporate culture, you know, et cetera, that I was going to really feel right to me. And so I felt like there was something missing for me at Taco Bell. So in addition to wanting to get back to Atlanta, I also was, you know, just kind of wanting to try uh, something else. And so ended up getting the opportunity to go to work for a company called Apple South, which at the time was the largest Applebee's franchisee. And, uh, you know, I was hired by them because they wanted the experience that I had at Taco Bell. You know, while they were a decent sized company as the largest franchisee of, uh, of Applebee's, they didn't have anybody who had the type of experience that I had gained in the last eight years uh, working for a company like Taco Bell and, uh, you know, understanding the discipline, the market research, the, the um, uh, process, uh, et cetera. And so they were wanting to really accelerate their growth at that time. And so um, uh, they saw me as someone that they could bring in to really help them figure out how to accelerate their growth. And so that experience that I had at Taco Bell really translated, uh, really translated well. And so they were open in about 20 stores a year at that point in time, and, um, and they, we accelerated up to about 60. Only stayed there for about uh, a year and a half, well, it was about 20 months, and um, wasn't, wasn't a great, uh, great fit for me. Uh, I was, first of all, it was while I was living in Atlanta, it was 67 miles away and because uh, they were in a small town in South Georgia and uh, so I had a long commute but also again just kind of felt like I'm not sure this is really the right fit for me uh, cultural, culturally and it was a little bit, uh, a little bit dysfunctional. And so then uh, this opportunity with Homestead Village uh, presented itself to me and so that was a step out of the restaurant industry, still in hospitality, Homestead Village was an extended stay hotel company. And so this was back in the mid 90s when extended stay America and Homestead and some of those other extended stay hotels were growing like crazy. So in the three years that I was there, we went from 15 to 120 uh, hotel properties and uh, started um, uh, as what was called a senior development manager and had the opportunity to leverage that experience that I had gained in the Northeast. So, um, you know, I was up there doing, um, I actually wasn't doing the front end real estate work. There I was hiring the team of consultants uh, and also a team, an internal team to do the entitlements. And so that was a great experience for me because more complex entitlements for uh, a hotel certainly than for a restaurant and to have the opportunity to leverage that Northeast experience and, um, and kind of do it in an, in an environment with a little bit more cl complex deals, both in terms of the geography and the type of development uh, was uh, a very great uh, uh, broadening experience uh, for me as well. And then uh, ended up uh, getting promoted to regional vice president of development, had the eastern half of the US and uh, had a team of about 26 people at that point, and uh, we opened uh, 27 new properties the last year that I was there. So the hotel industry is even more cyclical than some other industries because you know you uh, things get hot, everybody gets a lot of stuff in the pipeline, and then they take forever to come to fruition. And about halfway through coming to fruition everything's already slowed down. Uh, and so it really is a little bit of a boom and bust in the hotel industry. So this was my first experience with a RIF and essentially uh, the entire development team got let go in fall of 98. There were a couple people kind of uh, as the uh, lone survivors to kind of clean up the mess uh, that was left behind. Um, but it really, for me, created a huge opportunity for me. Um, 
because uh, I described it as getting, a, uh, getting put on scholarship for six months and uh, having some time to take a step back. It was, you know, after I was at that point, I guess I was like 12 years into my career, and it was a perfect time for me to really take a step back and think about what is it that I really want to do when I grow up, you know, and is, is what I've been doing really what I want to do? So I mentioned that I grew up playing golf, played on the golf team here. I always thought, geez, wouldn't it be nice if I could somehow marry golf and development? And so uh, one of the things I did was explore, you know, uh, trying to find an opportunity with a golf course developer. Um, I actually came down and, and uh, came down here and spent some time with Dean Kraft. He had been, he had actually been associate dean when I was in the MBA program, and he's somebody that has always been. You know, he's one of like three or four people that, when, you know, when I get asked who are the people that really made a difference in your career, he's one of the one of the three or four people that I always that I always name because he really made a difference for me. And so I came down and chatted with him a little bit. I, you know, really took a step back to think about what's important to me. What types of company companies do I like to work in? What type of culture? Um, and you know, because now I've been with one really large company and two smaller companies. I've been with two restaurant companies and a hotel company. And I would tell you that the real estate development in Homestead Village anyway, um, at that time was a little bit more like working for a development company. It was the, when you're in real estate for a restaurant company, you know, you're part of delivering on the strategy for that, um, for that restaurant brand, whatever it happens to be. At Homestead, it was a little more all about the deal, and we didn't really have, uh, you know, an operations team that had a ton of experience operating hotels. And at the end of the day, it was all about sort of just flipping it at some point. And to me, it just didn't feel like quite as long-term a point of view. And so I knew that maybe that wasn't exactly right for me. I also knew that I liked the structure and the discipline and the number of smart people that were around in a big company. Um, and so, you know, I really took time to think about all those things. I thought I wanted to live in Atlanta my whole life, so I said, oh, I'm just sure I'm going to stay in Atlanta. And um, ultimately got this opportunity with Darden, which is based in Orlando, uh, that seemed to check all of the boxes, you know, that really fit everything that I had identified uh, as what was important to me um, as I thought about um, uh, a company that I, that I wanted to be a part of. And so, um, so in, uh, in 99 then, I um, moved, to, uh, moved to Orlando and started with Darden. I will say, I did find a couple of opportunities where I could have done the golf course development stuff. Um, but I, what I learned is that, you know, I could have gone in and worked for somebody doing that and made a lot less money than what I was going to make going to work for Darden. Um, and I'm pretty risk averse, and so you know where the real money is is if you're the if you're the person taking the risk, right? And so that wasn't something that was uh, was of interest to me. So ultimately decided that you know that uh, that Darden uh, was uh, was clearly the fit. So I started with Darden then in uh, in 1999, and um, uh, and was there for 17 years and. I will tell you that I got lucky in that um, everything that I thought Darden was going in turned out to be, you know, exactly what it was. And it was a great fit for me, uh, a great organization. And if I were, uh, if I still had a desire to continue to be working in a, in a uh, corporate gig, I would still be there. Um, there was, I could have stayed for another five or 10 years and continued to have a great time. I just felt like I'd reached a point where I had, you know, accomplished uh, what I felt like I wanted to accomplish, and I uh, was looking for a little bit more flexibility and variety. So I kind of think about uh, I think about what I do now as as a bit of a portfolio of things that uh, um, you know that are interesting to me and, and that I'm passionate about where I want to spend my time. So uh, started as vice president of development for. Red Lobster, and um, you know, when I was joining Darden, 
one of the things that I learned in the interview process is that at the same time they were also hiring somebody for another development position. It was actually to be head of development for Bahama Breeze. And they mentioned that they viewed him as um, the person who they thought would be the successor for the chief development officer position. And so I was disappointed to hear that because I felt like that, you know, that would be something, you know, that I would certainly aspire to. Um, and I said, well, if that's the case, and you guys are pretty convinced that's how it's going to turn out, I need to meet him because he's likely going to be my boss. So we took that step in the process and I had the opportunity to meet him. But before I accepted, I said, okay, I get that. And I could see that I could, you know, I'd be okay working for him. Um, and I also hope that you'll remain open-minded about it, you know, and don't just assume that's how it's going to turn out. Let me have the opportunity to prove to you uh, that, um, you know, that I can do the job too. And he had more experience than me. You know, if I were picking, I'd have picked him, you know. Um, but I at least had the conversation. And then every six months, I'd, you know, remind my boss of that who was going to be retiring in the not too distant future and just say, hey, how am I doing? What are the gaps? What do you think, you know, what do you see that I need to be doing? And um, ultimately, um, it ended up not being a horse race between us because he ended up leaving before it ever came to fruition. So I imagine he would have gotten it. But the fact that I was having those conversations all along the way, he left. And then about six months later, my uh, boss, the chief development officer, retired. It was very clear who they were going to go with. And I actually had another peer that was just as qualified as I was, but he hadn't ever expressed interest in the role. And so I had sort of been convincing them to look at me in that way. And so they already had kind of framed me in that way. So, um, and I would have never done that earlier in my career. Um, but I just, when I joined Darden, I felt like, and it, this was all part of, you know, that time I had between Homestead Village and really thinking about what I wanted to do, I just made a decision that I was never going to not ask for what I wanted. And it's, it's, and it's amazing that people don't mind, you know, having, clarity about what it is that, you know, what it is that you're looking for. So anyway, um, that, uh, that uh, openness uh, certainly paid off well for me then. So I get into the chief development officer role, things are going well, and, you know, that was sort of the pinnacle of what I thought I wanted to do in my career, because um, I always just thought of myself as a development person. But then they started talking about, okay, well, what else could you do for us here? And so um, ended up um, ultimately being asked to uh, go lead Bahama Breeze. And this is another one of those where, you know, I said, well, why on earth do you think I could do that? <laughs> why do you want me to do that? And they said, well, you know, it's really about leadership. And, um, you know, we'll make sure that you've got a great team around you that knows some of the things that you don't know and um, had this amazing opportunity to run a business for 10 years. And Breeze was in a, uh, a bit of a tailspin at the time. It was very much a turnaround, so I thought it was uh, pretty risky. I already mentioned I'm risk averse, so I was a little nervous about all that. Uh, but ultimately, uh, it turned out well for me. And I always figured, you know, if it doesn't work out, hopefully I'd get the opportunity to go back into development someday. And having this experience will just make me a better development leader. And, um, and so uh, it ended up, you know, it ended up working out just great. And after, ten, after nearly 10 years in the role, um, we started talking about, you know, I'd always said I'd love to get back into development again at some point. And so we started talking about, you know, when that might happen and what would that look like. And 10 years having one leader, you know, run a brand is kind of, it's good to have a change at that point. So anyway, so then I had the opportunity. We were acquiring uh, the Yard House uh, brand, and uh, uh, we were wanting to grow it pretty aggressively. It was coming into what we called the specialty restaurant group, which also included Capital Grill, Bahama Breeze, Seasons 52, and Eddie V's. And so uh, slid back into development, uh, really working on the integration of Yard House and then running development for the remainder of those brands. And then um, about a year later, uh, went back into the chief development officer role until, uh, until I retired. 
And so now um, I've formed a you know, real estate advisory firm and it's, you know, it's an opportunity for me to uh, you know, work with growth oriented brands and help them figure out how to uh, achieve their potential, whether it's helping them build their pipeline or helping them think about their strategy, helping them think about what their team ought to look like, what their development team ought to look like, or you know, even going in on an interim or part-time basis as like a chief development officer. Um, but it was a very intentional move on my part to you know, have more flexibility and do a variety, of, a variety of things. So, man, that was a lot of really boring stuff. So, uh, but I got through it. So let me stop for a minute and you guys, what, I mean, what can I answer for you or what are you curious about as you think about a career path in this type of environment or anything else? I'm gonna, so, yeah, what thanks. sort of things you did to take Bob and Breeze out of a tailspin? Yep, so we, first thing we did was you know, just get some structure around some of our um, uh, operating controls, you know, so costs were a little crazy. Also, the brand had, had gotten off the rails. So what had, had initially been created to be um, uh, in sort of the brand positioning had evolved and had moved upscale and had gotten a lot more complex around the food. And so we uh, did a lot of work around getting clarity around our brand and our brand positioning, and then therefore a little more clarity around the menu. And then from there, we could take out some of the complexity and remove some of the things that didn't really add value for the guest. And by doing that, then you can execute at a higher level, you can execute with you know, better margins, lower costs, um, and when you're executing at a higher level and you're giving guests more of what they're looking for in their menu items and executing them better, it ultimately drives guest counts, therefore driving sales, helping improve margins, et cetera. So, that's kind of the snapshot of it. So a lot of it was around, you know, clarifying brand positioning, and um, and then you know, kind of first it was stopping the bleeding around some of the cost structure and whatnot, and then clarifying the brand positioning and growing the top line. Jake. Yeah. In your current role, what's some of the key personnel you see on like successful development teams? Key some person. You like personnel. Uh, well, in um, you know, in operating companies, it's you know, it's all about having the right uh, the right real estate folks, you know, selecting the sites uh, to begin with. Um, also, having a really high quality um, market research person. And I'm going to show you a chart here in a minute that's kind of the development process um, in a, in a restaurant operating company. Um, but you know, having the right discipline around uh, you know, market strategy and market research, and that's from having somebody in market research as well as uh, talented people in real estate. And then um, design teams are important too because you know, brands are always evolving and having to evolve the prototype and you know, do remodels and, and evolve the new build prototypes as well to, um, to fit you know, the evolving brand, so that's key as well. So you mentioned that you know you never expressed your ambitions or uh, position that you wanted earlier in your career, but you did um, here with Darden. Would that be something that you would recommend to us? You know, after a couple years in the workforce, be expressive of our ambitions to people that we trust, um, even though we're not like at a president level. Would that be something that you would recommend for us? Yeah, and uh, you know, I I made a joke earlier with the smaller group about you know. The worst thing you could do is after a year go in and say, I've been here a year, where's my promotion, right? So not that, <laughs> but for sure, um, you know, just being honest with your immediate supervisor or candid uh, with your immediate supervisor about how you want to grow your career. And, and, and it's less about saying, I want this job. This just happened to be circumstances where it, I kind of felt like I had to given what they told me. Because I was like, it was a little bit of a punch in the gut to learn during the interview process, we're going into a company where I hoped that I could someday be chief development officer, to have them tell me, you know, we're about to hire somebody who we think is gonna be the successor. I'm like, well, wait, why don't you think about me that way, right? It was, it was as if they just hadn't thought I would be thinking that, so I wanted to make sure they knew that I was thinking that. 
But I think, you know, any, hopefully, any good boss is gonna be having conversations with you fairly frequently about how you're doing, you know, and if there is a particular job that you aspire to, talk about what the gaps are and what do you need to see in me to have confidence that, you know, that that's a job that you think I could do with, you know, with excellence. Anything else? Okay. All right, so real estate development in a restaurant operating company. Um, so, you know, and this, is, this would be the same in Taco Bell and McDonald's, in Brinker, at Darden. You know, I, I think it's, uh, I think it's uh, uh, gonna be fairly consistent across the board. And, you know, it's really about maximizing uh, the growth and overall sales potential for an operating company. So it's not really um, as much about how you might, you know, and the, the contrast that Dr. Ling mentioned at the beginning, you know, it's not how you would normally think about real estate development per se, where, you know, you're thinking about a piece of real estate and how do you maximize the value of that asset. In fact, you know, often a restaurant use isn't the highest and best use for a piece of real estate. Um, but it's, um, uh, it's really about you know how do we how do we maximize uh, the growth potential for a particular brand um, and do it in a way that is value creating. So it's not just about opening a new restaurant and getting the additional sales. It's about opening a new restaurant and getting enough incremental sales to justify the investment in that new restaurant. Because if you've got a brand that's already got units out there, most likely there's going to be some sort of impact on an existing restaurant when you open a new restaurant. So you've got to factor that in. You also want to think about it from the perspective of um, if we think that this brand could ultimately um, have the potential to have a thousand units across the company, uh, across the country, if you think about you know, how many people per unit you think you need to support it, and you just kind of go through the math and you say a thousand is probably the number and you go start to break that down by market um, and you determine that in Orlando that you know you ought to be able to build 20 of those uh, of that particular brand in that market then you've got to be sure that you have a pretty good idea of where all 20 of those are going to go to start because otherwise you might build a location that's right in between where you could have had two locations. And so you've kind of sub-optimized uh, the market potential there. So, um, uh, so it's really about thinking of it from that perspective. And then, um, you know, development in, uh, in a restaurant operating company also includes remodels. And again, it's about continuing to evolve the brand and keeping them up to date, but being able to do it at a cost that makes sense based on what we think the incremental sales are that we're going to get in that unit once we remodel it. And then it also includes facilities and asset management support as well. So, uh, can you guys re read that? Maybe not. Um, so, I will try to talk through it a little bit here. So, this is sort of the, is there a pointer on here? No, it's coming out. Okay. So, you know, if you kind of think about a circular process, um, the process really starts at the top here uh, between real estate research and real estate. So, and it's really about creating the strategy, understanding what the potential is for the brand, and identifying, um, uh, you know, what the priorities are from that as well as looking at market optimization opportunities. So this would be a scenario where, you know, you might have um, a location that's in a trade area, the trade area shifted, the restaurant sales have declined, and if we close that one, there's a new trade area that's developed that might create the opportunity for us to build a new restaurant. And so real estate research, and I mentioned that kind of functional expertise um, uh, based on, uh, I think it was Jake's question, you know, they, um, you know, the, 
that's the, the functional area where they um, you know, help us think about that, uh, develop a forecasting tool, they maintain a competitive database, uh, they keep trade area database and analog tables, so that's all about you know, what's this trade area look like compared to another trade area where we have an existing location that's performing exceedingly well, how might, this, you know, how might we infer that a new restaurant would, uh, uh, would perform. Um, and so they partner with real estate. The real estate director then is the person who works in market, um, uh, sometimes with local brokers, uh, kind of doing the on the ground research, identifying and selecting the sites, negotiating the deal, and um, getting the internal site approval, and then ultimately leading the project through the process. So they kind of stay the quarterback of the deal until it starts construction. And then, uh, continue to move around the circle here. Um, there's uh, the real estate uh, person uh, partners with uh, development law, uh, one of the attorneys in the, on the development law team. They negotiate the contract or the lease and, um, and, be, and the development law folks also, you know, help us do all of the due diligence. And then we have, you know, there's an investment analysis or a finance team that's helping develop a pro forma. Uh, so you'd have a specific pro forma for a particular location that's built by brand with that brand's particular P&L. Um, so that we're thinking about, you know, over time, what's the cash flow going to look like from a restaurant that's going to be built on this site? And then, you know, how does that, you know, discounted cash flow compare to the level of investment? Um, and, uh, and then they help prepare the package, et cetera. I'm going to skip the building and campus services because that's really just about the, our office building campus, which really isn't about the development process. Then we've got a design team that partners with each of the brand presidents to ensure that we've got all of the uh, uh, design strategy standards in place and ensures that the building is really reflecting the brand, helps design the site and space plans, and um, manages the development of construction documents and also uh, helps with the due diligence and permitting process. So there's folks on the design team that are actually sort of function as permit expediter type folks. And then the construction team uh, is building the um, project budgets and working with the GCs to manage the project. And then it comes back around to operating restaurants. We have a facilities team that helps take care of those uh, and um, does all of the preventative maintenance and any ongoing capital projects that need to be done to keep the, the restaurants in great shape. And then from there, there's also an asset management team in place. So these are folks that have some real estate experience. Um, also, sometimes uh, those roles get, get uh, filled with people who might have some paralegal experience and they help with lease renewals and extensions. Um, anytime we have surplus property, they help with that disposition resolve any um, lease-related uh, or property-related issues, and then partner with real estate research to think about then how we think about the portfolio when we've got uh, opportunities, like I mentioned before, where there might be a need to close a restaurant or think about relocating a restaurant, et cetera. So again, a lot of stuff there, so let me, let me pause for a minute and uh, see if you have any questions about that process. Yes, sir. Would, would some of the design stuff naturally come before the investment analysis and uh, lease negotiations and things? It seems Absolutely. Absolutely. Especially less for like a, a brand like a Red Lobster and Olive Garden where it's prototypical, but for, you know, Capital Grill or Eddie V's or some of those where they were going into existing spaces, every design's a little bit different. Um, all of that is very much happening at that point. Uh, so, and you know, as you can imagine, you know, all of that process is loosely follows that, but everybody's working together throughout the whole throughout the whole process. Were you doing any negotiated work as general contractors? It was all hard to stuff. No, from time to time we'd negotiate, and it would really depend on the project. You know, if we had a really complex project that we needed to get done really quickly. Uh, we might do that, and we do it with somebody that um, we use in a competitive bid environment a lot, so we had a point of view on 
where their costs would be. Um, but yeah, absolutely, we would do that from time to time. But uh, uh, not the norm, you know. But we would do that from time to time. So I thought I saw another hand. Yeah. So do you let proximity to your competition kind of affect your side selection, or do you, do you believe enough in your brand that it doesn't matter who's next to you? Um, I would say it depends. Um, <coughs> generally, probably not uh, a huge consideration. Uh, unless that competitor's not performing well. So one of the most important bits of information that we would include in our process of deciding whether we were gonna proceed with the site is what are the competitive volumes. It also happens to be one of the hardest pieces of information to get accurately, um, but really critical. And so certainly if we knew that there was a competitor in the trade area that wasn't performing well, then we might not even bother you know, with the trade area, unless there was some rational explanation for it. So their site wasn't so good, and the site that we were uh, looking at you know, had much better access or visibility, or you know, there was something about the performance of that location that we could explain, um, and that we thought we could overcome, or sometimes there might be a market where um, our brand does really well in Dallas, and we know that that competitive brand historically has not done well in Dallas, so maybe that's what's driving it. So all of those things are considerations for sure. Yep. How does that analysis change when you get into like a Butler Plaza situation where you're not really beating anyone to the punch and like there's a million competitors within a mile? Yep, so <laughs> uh, you, uh, you just have to feel like that's the type of trade area that you just gotta be there no matter what. And no, and again, it's all, it's looking at the volumes. And so we know how well the Olive Garden did in the old location historically. Um, and we knew how well other folks in the trade area did, et cetera. And so we thought about it for Bahama Breeze and for Longhorn, you know, we knew the trade area was strong to begin with. Were we concerned about all the competition coming in? Um, yeah, absolutely, but also felt like, uh, you know, that there was probably enough to go around, so. Is yeah. that a way you think that your job or the industry in general is changing with the rise of mixed use and people wanting all of those competitors being in the same place now? Yeah, you know, that's a, that's a great question and a great point. Um, you know, it's, I, I led development at Darden two different times one in the early, two, once in the early 2000s and then the second time a few years ago. And I can't tell you how different a job it was in, you know, in 2000, you know, say 2012 to 2016 versus where it was back in 2002, 2001. You know, back then, first from a Darden perspective, back then really all we had was, um, you know, we had Red Lobster and Olive Garden and, um, and Bahama Breeze, and we were just getting started with Seasons 52. But, you know, it was mostly, and Red Lobster and Olive Garden, we were mostly doing, you know, mall pads or, um, you know, some daily needs shopping centers, et cetera. So then, you know, fast forward 10 years, come back into the development world. So the brands at Darden, you know, include um, uh, Yard House, Capital Grill, Eddie V's, Longhorn, which Longhorn obviously behaved more like Red Lobster and Olive Garden. But, and several of those brands were all inline locations. And this whole, um, you know, lifestyle center was the deal. And so very different thought process and approach. And we used to be able to uh, command, um, you know, pretty onerous competitive exclusions in our deals. And then all of a sudden, you know, that changes, you know, and landlords weren't willing to, to give those as generously as they had before. So definitely a huge change and, you know, a big shift in how we have to, have to think about things uh, for sure. Yep. Um, after you do all this market research, how do you handle a bust? So everything came out positive. You were supposed to do the investment. You did it, and it didn't work out. From a corporate point of view, how do you guys handle it? Yeah, so um, we try to learn from it. And in some cases, it's so bad that ultimately you have to close the location. In other cases, we look at it and say, OK, what could we 
what could we fix that might solve it? You know, so could we get additional signage? Could we, um, um, is there something with the access that if we could change it, it would make a difference? Uh, could we get a rent concession from the landlord? Um, so, you know, going through all of that process, but, you know, we, we, we would try to be honest with ourselves about what's the issue. You know, there's the joke in the industry is, is that, um, you know, strong new restaurant openings are all about great operations and poor new restaurant openings are bad sites. Well, we know that's not always true. And so also sometimes it's, it didn't, it didn't get run right to start, you know, and so what do we need to do to fix operations and get those guests back in? Sometimes that's the case too. So it's really exploring all of that and trying to be candid about it. And then, but if we have to cut our losses, trying to figure out how we can do that too, so. So um, government involvement, obviously, we're, you know, through the permitting process, um, you know, we're, we, members of the team are very involved in dealing with, you know, the folks that uh, work in various roles within a city, and so maintaining those relationships are important. We have, a, uh, you know, at, at Darden, we had a great uh, government affairs department, and it's not something that you want to use all the time, but every now and then when we were having a tough permit issue, you know, we could sometimes, you know, just have a conversation with somebody that could help us maybe just free something up, right? Just kind of get something out of a gridlock situation. Um, so certainly having those relationships and being a good neighbor in the community is critically important. And so, um, you know, just because we're open in a new restaurant in one particular trade area, somebody may know of Darden or that particular brand from how they operate in another part of the city. And so making sure that we're doing all the right things um, in those existing locations to uh, be involved in the community in the right way and be a good neighbor. And certainly the restaurant general managers are all very much involved in the chamber and other local communities. and do a nice job of giving back in the community, so that, that's important. And then the other question was about the different functional areas. Yeah, well certainly you need people who have all of these, you know, you, you, you need people with these skills. And so uh, sometimes you have members of the team that you know, are, are, um, have always been in construction management and those people are hugely uh, uh, valued. Um, same thing with facilities and design. Um, and what's really great then is when you have people that have the ability to cross over. So you know, I, I was telling some of the folks earlier that you know, I, I can count on one hand the number of folks that I've crossed in my career that had true functional expertise in construction and were also good managers and leaders. You know, they're just the, the there's, uh, and so I think, you know, the folks that are in the room that are, have the BCN and the MSRE uh, combined degree, I think that's a great skill set. Um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't automatically take that and say and jump to, I want to go be a real estate developer then. I would actually encourage, go get some hands-on construction experience and then leverage it. Um, because I just think that's hugely valuable if you've got somebody that's got real life construction experience who also um, has a good business mind, can think about the strategy and gets how all the pieces get put together like, you know, like you'd be learning in this program. So, um, and the development law, you know, having a good attorney
that knows how to do real estate deals, there's no, um, there's no substitute for that. I mean, and, and uh, uh, so, because they, there's a, uh, just somebody who has enough understanding, similar to what I just said about construction, enough understanding for the business part of the deal uh, to be a great legal partner is huge. So all of those skills are really critically important and somebody that's got more than one of them is really awesome. That's, that's what I've known anywhere I've been, so I don't know. You guys that are in the VCN program may have a point of view on whether that's a normal or abnormal thing. Yeah. Yep. Anything? Yep. For, for Darden, did you guys primarily own the land or did you primarily lease and what was that balance like? So hold that thought, because that's the next section is gonna be all about that, okay. so. Uh, anything else on this? Okay. All right. So, uh, oops, pushing the wrong button here. All right. So, I mentioned at the beginning the third part of what I was going to talk about was monetizing Darden's real estate. So, in 2015, we went through a process of, uh, of, creating value from our real estate. So what did that mean? You know, we uh, historically, uh, so Darden started with Red Lobster back in the late 60s, and it was part of General Mills. General Mills had a restaurant division. And so then Darden and Olive Garden, I mean, um, Olive Garden and, and uh, Red Lobster were part of General Mills restaurants until about 1997 or 1998. So just just a couple years before I joined Darden, and then General Mills spun Darden out. And, um, and then Darden's been publicly traded ever since then. Uh, because during the time of General Mills ownership and also just the nature of the real estate industry back then, we bought almost everything. Uh, and that was our strong preference. General Mills had plenty of cash. They were hap happy to spend it in the restaurant division, and we always felt like you know, um, that, you know, we had a better cost of capital than anybody, you know, any of our landlords did, et cetera. And so we had a bias for owning property and we also felt like it gave us a little more flexibility. So when you do get a site that doesn't work, it's a heck of a lot easier uh, to unwind a deal that's owned than one, that, uh, than one that's leased. And so we just had a, had a bias for ownership. Well, fast forward, you know, 20 years, uh, well, 15 years, I guess. And, you know, the real estate industry had really changed. Everybody would moved to this asset light uh, perspective on their, both the real estate ownership as well as owning the operating business. You know, I think you probably know mo many, most uh, restaurant companies now franchise the vast majority of their locations. Um, and, um, and then, either before, and if they did it from refranchising, so selling stores that were company units, um, they probably monetized the real estate first as a sale lease back and then sold the business to the franchisee. And so most everybody else had done that. Um, but again, we had kind of a culture and a mindset that, you know, that that wasn't necessarily the right thing from a Darden perspective. But, um, you know, the, the environment had changed and we had uh, an activist investor that uh, had a point of view that, um, you know, we needed to, that we would unlock shareholder value by monetizing the real estate and a point of view that a dollar of real estate income is more valuable uh, to a shareholder or gets a higher multiple uh, and therefore more value, valuable to a shareholder than a dollar of you know, thin margin you know, restaurant operating income. And so um, after, the, you know, after the activists' involvement, then you know, we uh, uh, kind of took a, took a step back and looked at all of these elements. So we went through um, a process uh, where we 
and I'm going to just hit the highlights here and I'll go into a little bit more detail. So we did 64 individual sale leaseback transactions. We did a REIT spin, and then we did a sale lease back of our office building. And so obviously a pretty fun project uh, to get to work on and uh, you know a lot of different interesting uh, components to it. But at the time we had a little over 1,500 restaurants, and of those we had 573 roughly that were owned. And then um, of those, you know, there were about 500 that we looked seriously at, including in either the REIT or the sale leasebacks. Some of them we quickly excluded because, you know, they were in, they were in locations that we felt like the trade area had shifted and we might, you know, want to be relocating it. And you certainly wouldn't want to throw it into, um, into the REIT or do a sale leaseback with it if you didn't think you wanted to be there long term. Um, and so mostly the ones that we excluded pretty quickly were locations that, uh, that had something like that going on where we just felt like it, it uh, wasn't the right thing to include it in, a, in the transaction. So we went through, um, we went through a process of, uh, on the sale leasebacks, really went through a very rigorous uh, property selection and rent setting process. Um, and so some of the things that, you know, that we needed to think about was, you know, which properties of, of all these that we, wanna, that we want to include in this um, execution of this strategy, which ones might be better to go into the sale, to individual sale leaseback, or which ones would be included in the REIT. And so a um, uh, couple things that, you know, obviously with Olive Garden being the biggest brand and also a brand that we owned the most properties, highest percentage of the properties, um, both sale leasebacks and the REIT were going to include a lot of Olive Garden properties. And so we, as we thought about the REIT though, if we could include as many of the other brands in the REIT um, as we could, and fewer Olive Gardens, we were going to be better off in terms of creating a little bit more diversity in the REIT. Now, granted, there's not a ton of diversity in the REIT to begin with because they're all Darden owned and operated properties. There's great geographic d diversity because, you know, essentially every state um, and, uh, you know, all over the country and all of the major markets, but we felt like it would be good, you know, to the extent possible, keep the, the um, REIT as diverse as we could. So we ended up including almost all Olive Gardens in the um, sale leaseback transactions. Could I just for a yeah. So what did, um, what, what did the, the other restaurants get spun up? What did Fred Lobster? Just so that, before. So it's not in that mix because those were sold. They were sold them. just before. So um, we, um, we sold Red Lobster to Golden Gate Capital uh, in the summer of 2014, and then we started work on this in the fall of 2014 and completed it in, um, in so the fall of 2015. So there, there were no Red Lobsters. So there were no Red Lobsters, and Golden Gate did one big sale leaseback transaction with, um, uh, it was uh, ARCP, but it, which then quickly became <laughs> Vayreed or whatever it is, I think, yeah. Yeah, and now I think they've, you know, some of those, that, that REIT has sold and diversified. So, uh, so most of the sale leasebacks were Olive Gardens. We selected the highest tax basis properties because the REIT was going to be a tax-free spin, and I, I, it was the last tax-free REIT spin, I think, that occurred because the code changed uh, right after that. Um, so, you know, we had, to, as we were thinking about it, we had to make sure that the after-tax, essentially the after-tax cap rate that we'd, that we'd uh, deliver would be, you know, at least as good as what we thought we'd be able to get in the REIT. Um, these things, it was crazy how they got snatched up, from these 1031 buyers, because there had never been any, any Darden properties in the sale leaseback market before. And so it was really a lot of fun to work on it because uh, it was fast and furious, the deals happened quick. And uh, you know we got the 64 deals done pretty quick, and we wanted to get out ahead of it and do those prior to the REIT because it gave us a little bit of a benchmark 
for setting the market for the REIT. You know, so the little bit of logic behind, hey, look at what, look at how these Darden properties are being valued as we think about, you know, what the value of that REIT spin looks like. So those were the individual sale lease backs. Um, oh, you know, one thing I'd say on the rent setting process, so we literally, and this applied for both the sale lease backs and all the properties that went into the REIT, but, you know, we literally went through a property by property process where we looked at the market value for each of the properties. Um, we looked at the performance of each of the restaurants and wanted to be sure we met certain um, you know, EBITDA coverage ratios. We wanted to make sure that we didn't exceed you know, certain levels of rent as a percent of sales. And, um, and so you know, in, you know, for us, it was all about making sure that we didn't do anything to over rent the properties because that wasn't going to be good for the long term view of Darden as an operating company. And quite honestly, it wasn't going to be good for the REIT either um, to, you know, have, um, you know, have rents that were too high, you know, they're going to, as they start to go sell them and diversify, they're going to trade at higher cap rates than they could sell them if they were, you know, if the rents were more in line and they could show, you know, that uh, um, how those restaurants were performing relative to those rents. So, um, I feel great about that the process that we went through and really set up both companies uh, for success, for sure. Um, so REIT spend similar process as it relates to the property selection and rent setting. We ended up, so I mentioned 64 individual sale leasebacks. We ended up including 424 properties in the REIT. Um, actually, 418 of them were um, uh, you know, were Darden properties that we were running back. Six of them were six uh, Longhorn restaurants that the REIT actually became the franchisee for, the, for those six restaurants. You know, there's the whole requirement of the taxable REIT subsidiary or the active trader business, and so that um, the, those, um, they became a franchisee, the REIT became a franchisee um, of, uh, of Longhorn in one market. So. That 418 actually meant f with the six that they were franchising, 424 actually transferred into the REIT. And then the mix included Olive Garden, Longhorn, um, uh, uh, Bahama Breeze, and Seasons 52, the other brands we didn't have any owned properties. So give you a sense, so that was in the, the spin occurred in November of 2015 and um, the Four Corners uh, was trading at just over 18 bucks a share then, and Darden was trading at uh, a little over $50 a share then, and Four Corners was like at 27 or 28 today, and Darden was at 118, I think. Um, we also, there was a uh, plan that the, that the dividend for Darden and Four Corners combined would be at least what Darden's historic dividend had been, which was 220 a share. Um, that equivalent uh, dividend today is like 330 a share. So it's panned out pretty nicely. Now a lot of that is that you know there was a lot of other things going on at the time um, within Darden in terms of um, focusing on um, getting back to basics and some ops excellence and executing. And so there was a lot of operational. And execution changes that occurred where the you know where the company was performing better and kind of hitting on all cylinders uh, across uh, across all of the brands and then this was you know just another element of it. Is there a little resistance to the activist investor? I mean, just talk a little bit about you know, sort of the corporate culture and an activist investor telling you should lease instead of own. And yeah, well, there was a there was a lot of resistance <laughs> and uh, um, you know it's a. Uh, The whole activist shareholder process is a little bit like a political campaign. And, you know, they put out a deck, you know, that says all the things that, you know, could be changed to improve the shareholder value of the company. And, you know, of course, it's only based on information that they have available to them that's public or conversations that they have with people who used to be employees of the company, et cetera. And so it's always frustrating when you're inside the company when all this is going on. Um, the great news, I'd say, in this scenario 
is that um, you know as they um, got involved, and I don't know if you all are aware, but so Starboard was the activist investor, and they ended up, their entire board slate won. So they won the pro proxy battle and replaced the entire board, which to my knowledge has never happened before. And so, you know, there was obviously a lot of resistance leading up to that proxy fight, but, you know, in, in the process, you know, the, our CEO resigned and, you know, then we, um, after Starboard, the new board came in, then they, um, the great news is, is that they selected uh, as interim CEO, and then they selected him as, um, as permanent CEO, and he's still CEO, the fellow who had been the chief operating officer. And so all of the operational improvements that I mentioned, he had started, you know, you know, sort of for the kind of year or so leading up to when the activists won the proxy fight. He had already started doing a great job with kind of evolving some of uh, some of our operational aspects of the business. So we were already on a great path from that perspective. And so when the new board got in and they saw some of that, you know, he got credit and he got the job. And so as a result, we didn't lose any traction of what we had been doing because, you know, I mean, if, we, if they had replaced him, it's like everything we've done in the last 18 months, throw out the window because the new CEO is going to come in and have a diff very different point of view on it. So there was already great traction there. And so, you know, once they got in and got to know us, they had all the facts, then it ended up being a really, really pretty great uh, working relationship and partnership in terms of figuring out. Because what we ended up doing in terms of monetizing the real estate was not nearly as big a transaction or um, you know, not as high a rents as what they had assumed in all their modeling, but we talked to them about it and explained why we thought, you know, uh, our rationale for why we thought um, our, the, the approach relative to our rent setting and other aspects of the transaction made sense. And they were very open and it was a great partnership. One of the board members was actually somebody who came out of you know, the REIT world, and so he was a key player in, as in all of the strategy of uh, you know, kind of sorting through it. He was put on the board for this purpose specifically, and he ended up being a great partner as well for all of us. So it was, you know, ended up being you know, a really pretty great experience, and we're all enjoying the, the, uh, the rewards of the uh, growth in the, in the stock price over the years. We have a question. Yes, <laughs> sorry. I Uh, well, there's, I'm not sure I can quote the, uh, the REIT requirements specifically, but there's, it's, it's an active trade or business okay. as part of the REIT and something, it also gets called a taxable REIT subsidiary, but to qualify as a REIT, you have to have kind of an operating business where you have some income that's not just, um, uh, that's not just uh, rental income. Does any, in, anybody want to correct me on that, or I, I, that's what I believe? <laughs> that's, that's what I remember. REITs provide some services that don't qualify as income for the REIT test, so they spend those off in the taxable REIT subsidiaries. Right. So. Um, and then last, we also did a sale leaseback. We have a beautiful office building and campus uh, in, uh, in Orlando um, and uh, that we you know, that we built, and so we ended up doing a sale lease back of that. So that was another, another way to uh, monetize, the, uh, monetize the real estate. So, um, uh, you guys, no way can you read that, right? So these are the slides that I mentioned that I pulled straight from Darden's analyst presentation. So I'm just going to hit a couple highlights here and, uh, and make the points. Um, so you know, we started the process of figuring all this out in like the late fall, uh, winter of uh, 2014 and early into 2015. And then in June of 2015, during our you know, quarterly um, analyst call, we kind of walked through the rationale for the real estate separation and provided some perspective on what we were gonna do. So we you know, felt like it was gonna improve our capital structure. It was gonna give us the opportunity um, between the transactions that we were doing as well as other cash that we had on the balance sheet, we were going to um, repay about a billion dollars in debt. 
and we felt like the REIT would have a lower cost of capital than Darden, and that would be uh, another part of the improved capital structure. Um, we talked about the capital light strategy, uh, reducing investment risk by shifting the capital and real estate investment uh, risk to landlords and, um, and then allowing us to use that capital across other initiatives. And, um, and then we talked about you know, a, a transaction that was, would support a conservative balance sheet going forward. And I talked about you know, using filters of EBITDA coverage and rent as a percent of sales, et cetera. And then you know, the other key point was properly reflecting the fair market value of the real estate. So, uh, and that was what I mentioned earlier about higher valuations for real estate companies compared to restaurant operating companies. So that was how we talked about the rationale. And then in, in September of 2015, uh, we walked through um, on the analyst call. Um, and again, any of this would be available on the Darden website if you wanted to go, um, if you wanted to go look at it. But um, you know, we, we talked about the, the details because we were further along in it and we really had good visibility into exactly what we were going to do. So we had uh, we talked about separating 488 restaurants, so it was the 424 plus 64 individual sale leasebacks and um, the six, you know, which included the six Longhorns that um, would be franchised. Um, the other part that, you know, that we had to consider is, you know, obviously we're selling the properties, so we're taking rent now onto our P&Ls that hadn't existed before. So, you know, there was all of the math for the analysts around, here's what our incremental rent's going to be. So we were going to have about $108 million, um, in incremental cash rent. Um, we'd also have a reduction in depreciation and interest expense, though, because we were going to be retiring debt. And, the depreciation get passed on to the REIT. So that was about um, uh, 96 million to the good. Um, and so, um, you know, so we had a little bit of a gap where the P&L was going to look um, not as good as it had been before. We were going to have more expense on the P&L. The great news is, as I mentioned, we had all of these operational um, initiatives going on that were improving things. And so we actually uh, kind of closed that gap uh, in our margins so that we never really saw, you know, that we never really saw the hit from it because we had operational improvement at the same time. Uh, I mentioned about the, re the dividend, the combined dividend uh, being at least what Darden had been before, which was 220, and now today it's at like 330 or 335. And then just some of the details on the individual sale leasebacks. So, we averaged cap rates on those 64 individual sale leasebacks of 5.4%, um, uh, which was pretty strong um, compared to what else was going on out there at the time. Um, the uh, base lease term was about 15.4 years, average rent per restaurant, $207,000. And uh, we only provided um, annual rent increases of 1% in those sale leaseback leases. For the REIT, um, we, uh, the, you know, the equivalent cap rate was roughly 6.25%, similar uh, uh, average lease term of 14.7, rent of 226 on average, and uh, we provided 1.5% uh, annual increases uh, for the REIT. Uh, and then this is just a, a final summary, so that in December, then we kind of were telling the final story because we'd completed the transaction in November. Uh, we still had two of our individual sale leasebacks that hadn't closed yet, but the REIT had been spun. We closed on the sale of the support center. And, uh, uh, and so ultimately, you know, it produced net proceeds of $631 million. And, uh, and so, you know, as we said, we used that to retire debt along with some other cash. So we retired about a billion dollars in debt. So. The sale leasebacks so were almost exclusively to individual uh, 1031 exchange buyers. Would that benefit, like the, the tax benefits exclusively for the buyer, correct? Oh, yeah, yeah, right. I guess, why the emphasis then? Like, did that do oh, it was. It really wasn't an emphasis. That's just who's out there buying out. sale leasebacks in the market. Okay. And it, it was insane to me. They, they would pay crazy prices, I thought, you know. <laughs> 
uh, because they just needed to do something quick to flip into it, you know. And um, but you know, because I just hadn't really prior to this, I hadn't paid as close of attention to that market. Um, but those were the those were the types of people who were buying them. Yes. Was there a reasoning between um, with the sale lease backs of doing them individually and not grouping them together and putting them in portfolios? Well, uh, mainly because we they were easy to do quick and. Uh, we, were, we were able to command such high cap rates on an individual basis as opposed to finding a bigger buyer, you know. Um, as I mentioned, Golden Gate did a uh, portfolio with Red Lobster, um, but, you know, for the, for the limited locations that we did, it was not overly taxing for us to sort of manage those transactions, and we got much better cap rates uh, than we would have gotten uh, in a portfolio. At least that was our point of view. Um, during your entire time in the workforce, you're still learning. What was your biggest regret or what is your biggest accomplishment to date? Uh, during when? Or just the whole time you worked. Oh. Like <laughs> when you graduated from now. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, for a regret, I would say there were a couple times where I clearly made a bad decision on somebody that I hired and, you know, should have just cut my losses sooner. And it sounds a little, uh, sounds a little harsh, but it's all about fit, you know, and somebody having the right skill set and, you know, being a right cultural fit as well. And so that was a that was a learning. So you know, I look at a couple times where it's like, ah, if I'd have moved quicker there. Um, and I don't know accomplishments. I mean, I feel great. I, somebody asked me that earlier, and and I, I just said, you know, I have my kind of bedrock core values that have been important to me because that's who my parents were: integrity and humility. And I feel like um, I was able to. Um, you know, live my career um, in a way that uh, I was true to myself and true to those core values. And um, as a result, you know, I think I had some success and built <coughs> credibility with people pretty quickly and, and um, have a, a, you know, a reputation in the industry that, you know, people think I do good work and I'm a good person, you know. So I think, you know, it's, that's, to me, that's more important than um, you know than any specific project per se is uh, is how people think about you. And then you know the other thing is just having the opportunity over the years to you know work with great teams and um, you know have the opportunity to you know help people hopefully you know achieve um, you know success in their career and achieve their dreams. So. Boy, that's a great one. If you figure that out, let me know. <laughs> um, it really is hard, um, but I, you know, it's. I think it's more about uh, probably asking about, uh, you know, what are the types of people that they enjoy being with and being around. You know, what have been some of the most rewarding experiences that they've had in their career. Um, uh, you know, um, when they've, um, you know, had, you know, sometimes it's about how they treat people too, you know, so when they've had a, you know, challenging boss or a challenging team member, you know, how did they approach that, things like that, you know. So it's tough though. Sometimes it's about too, sometimes people self-select, right? So sometimes it's about creating understanding of too about what kind of culture you have in that company as well. Because there's no, there's no point trying to paint a picture that's different than what it is, because uh, that's just, that's not going to be good for anybody. What else? Yep. You mentioned that the restaurant and hospitality industry tends to be asset light today. Yep. Is there any scenario in the near future 
you see that trend changing? No, I don't think so. Are you seeing or hearing anything any different in that regard? Yeah. Is it very much a product of some of the restaurant chains or some of them own more than others? Yeah, but even, um, you know, so we were kind of the last big holdout, I would say. But then Brinker also, they still owned a fair amount of properties and they just did 50 or 60 sale leasebacks and they, and actually Four Corners, Property Trust bought about half of them. And then somebody else, I can't remember who the other REIT was, bought the other half. And, um, and that's been the other thing that's been kind of fun to watch Four Corners. You know, so they've been able to, they sold some of our, uh, some of our really high value properties and see now they can be in a, they can be a 1031 exchange um, buyer and seller, right? And so they sold some of our, uh, some of the uh, Darden high value properties and then use that in a 1031 and then use the proceeds from that to buy, you know, some Burger Kings or, you know, they're, they've, so they've, they're, they're remaining um, a REIT that's specifically focused on restaurants, but they've diversified the brands within their portfolio. Um, so, so I think um, my guess is um, with Brinker, and I didn't go try to dig and see, but I believe my guess is with those sale leasebacks, that was probably the last of their owned real estate would be my guess. And they're still mostly company operated. They have more franchise locations than Darden does, but I think they're still mostly company. But most everybody else, you know, like Applebee's is like 100%, you know, essentially 100% franchise. Taco Bell still has, you know, some company operated restaurants, but they're almost all franchise and almost all of their growth is through franchise growth. So um, it seems like that's the way things are for now anyway. And, you know, who knows what the impotence will be, you know, that changes that at some point. At some point, a dollar of restaurant operating income will get command a higher multiple than real estate income maybe if the markets change enough and then maybe it flips back, you know, I don't know. It's all about um, creating shareholder value and maximizing shareholder value. Do you regret retail as a kind of a career focus? What's that? Do you regret retail as kind of a career focus? No, no, it was fun. I mean, really, it's it's a it's a fun business, and and I guess I didn't say this when I was talking about sort of what is you know, real estate in in you know in that world. I mean, I really liked that it was part of delivering against an overall brand strategy, you know, and growing a business, you know, as opposed to you know maximizing the value of a particular asset. So that's, I really always enjoyed that. And because there's so many moving parts, you know, it's just, it's not just about the right site and the right deal, but it's also, you know, are the operators delivering? What do we need to do to keep the brand fresh? And how can we help with that from a development perspective, et cetera? So. So biggest risk I've ever taken was when I decided to go run Bahama Breeze because I didn't know what the heck I was doing and, and it was a struggling brand. Um, and I also, and I was gonna say no. And I literally like went to bed the night before I was supposed to tell them what I decided, saying I'm not gonna do it. And I got out of the shower the next morning and said, how can I say no? You know, cause it's like, when do you get an opportunity like this? And, that's the kind of thing you say no to, you probably never get the opportunity again. And, um, and so that was you know, a huge uh, learning curve for me um, and a really uh, a time of huge personal growth uh, and growth as a leader and uh, something that I would never have traded for anything now that I look back on it, so. Uh, well, it was, it was mostly about, um, uh, it was mostly about 
the brand positioning work because we, we changed, you know, we sort of redirected pretty significantly and that was going to take some time. And so there's a little bit of nervousness about would we have enough time and would it work quick enough. Um, and so, you know, that was, that was a risk. The other thing I would say, some, somebody asked about a regret earlier. I forgot the one regret I had. And I, so now my theory on change is if you gotta, if you gotta lead an organization through change, you might as well go really big because it's just as hard to lead through small change as it is through big change. And so part of getting things right at Bahama Breeze, we had some underperforming locations that we needed to close. And um, we ended up having to do two rounds of closings instead of one because we didn't go big enough the first time. And that was hugely painful because, you know, one time you can convince the team it's all going to be all right and hang in with us. And then you do it the second time. But you said before we wouldn't have to go through this again kind of thing. So never say never, first of all. But then also, you know, if you're going to make a big change, <coughs> rip off the mandate and go big. Any last questions? Yeah, that's a great question. It was really interesting because um, I was at Bahama Breeze at the time. We got hurt pretty hard. Um, it, it, and it was a tale of two cities at Darden. Olive Garden killed it through the recession because it was a value brand. Um, and Capitol Grill just got killed. Um, but then Capitol Grill came back pretty quick. You know, they had a year and a half, two years, and then they bounced back really quick. And then Olive Garden actually kind of tailed off when things got better and everybody else started doing better, you know, and that's when then they had to do a little bit of, of uh, you know, uh, reinventing and evolving. So, um, but it really just depended on the brand. And I will tell you that we were actually helped by the fact at that point that we hadn't already done some of the real estate transactions because some of the folks that were either franchisees or had over rented their properties couldn't survive it you know if sales drop that much you can't afford you know you can't afford your rent anymore um, and so we were in a little bit better position than some of the other restaurant companies out there um, at that point and even if that were to happen again again I feel like we had took such a balanced approach that you know we didn't, don't have too much rent uh, more than what should be against any of them so last chance all right, well, thank you very much. Absolutely, my pleasure.